Hello and welcome. <laughs> My name is CCR Chagra. Let me begin by introducing the pilot episode of The Word Show, an acronym for The Worlds of Resolved Dichotomies Show, a roundtable series of free and critical thinkers, a series focusing on two words, resolve and transcend, each episode focusing on a subtext introduced by the host. Tonight, on our roundtable, Paul Skiff, writer, artist, performer, and producer of cultural events. We are pleased to have him here. Also, Marty Alsop, as in Mardi Gras, Mar Mariana Alsop. Marty is a uh, nurse practitioner by profession. Her alter egos are poet, writer, wife, mother, superwoman, codename Enigma. Also with us on the round table, Linda Olson Graham. She is a global peace poetess, Colorado Department of Peace Poet Laureate, mother, relation, and friend. Myself included on the round table, I am a poet, artist, concept creator, producer, and free speech activist. And our host, in addition to being a poet, professor, host, and son and brother, he is the producer of his own show, Quintessential Listening Poetry Online Radio, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram. Now, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram, as the premier host of this vision, will, in his role, address how the union between us and our free voices can be exercised one voice at a time. The premiere episode is more than a podcast, but a vision. Please allow me to ask this question. Why are we here? In a word, to create resolve, even if the state or states of reality appear to be unresolvable. We are here to be the creative minds of our time, here to transcend the impossible. We are yeah. here to talk about and explore <laughs> ideas, to open new vistas of understanding that will, through dialogue and discussion allow us to gain the skills to inspire ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Listeners of the Earth, please welcome the artist and man behind quintessential listening poetry online radio, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram. All right, all right. Hello, everyone. Hello, Michael. Hey. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hello, Hello, Michael. Michael. <laughs> how could you forget that? Love, love. Yeah. That's how I mean. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. It is an honor to be a part of something new, a new experience, a new way of being. But I wanted to give the credit today to Cece Chagra. He's the man of the hour. He worked exceptionally hard behind the scenes to make this happen. So, Cece, all the kudos go to you. Hey, All right. So what I'd like to ask you first, though, is what did you hear CC say? What are your thoughts about what he said? Anyone? Oh, yes. Let me say one more thing. I'm a professor from the old school. I'm a retired professor, actually. I'm the kind of professor who will call on you. All right. And this is a very small crowd. It wouldn't take much for me to call your name. So <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about what Cece said? Talk to me. Well, I thought that Cece invited us to just be a forum of people discussing topics that I think will benefit ourselves and, and those that hear the podcast. All right. Very nice. You know, to be to be in a group of minds that are intentionally thinking about uh, the topics that, that have been presented, it's just, it's a joy. Very nice. Thank you, Linda. Oh, sure. Anyone else? What did you hear Cece say? Well, Cece, if you're familiar with a lot of his own work also, you know, a lot of this goes back to consciousness raising or conscious, being conscious right. and right. raising awareness. These are things, you know, uh, uh, Linda referred to as, a, you know, talking about an open forum. Uh, and so uh, that's what I understand the intentionality of this proceeding to be focused on. And I think drawing together people from uh, uh, 
particularly, you know, creative people who have a, pra a poetry pa practice uh, heightens the uh, prospect that, um, you know, the kind of language and wordplay and kind of excavating of the meanings that are essential to our being able to do this consciousness, consciousness raising, is kind of enhanced by the fact that you've drawn in this collection of individuals who uh, live poetically and that puts them in touch with uh, existence and uh, sensibilities in ways that uh, people who aren't poets aren't uh, uh, quite engaged with on those levels. All right, very nice. I like that. I like that. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. What did you hear? What are your thoughts? Um, it just made me think about something. Um, I was going to say poets are the, 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 the voices of the many, or are we the voices of the few? You know, so, you know, we say things or we bring out um, ideas or thoughts that a lot of people are afraid to talk about. And sometimes, you know, um, we're able to channel the feelings of what other people uh, might have going on in their life that they aren't able to speak about. And we're, I think, uh, to have a panel of people that are poets or are creative um, mm -hmm. that are not afraid to be very candid about certain, you know, topics or, you know, discussion. So I think it's a wonderful thing, a collection of minds, you know, one mm -hmm. mind is like we have one, two, three, five people here that are speaking, but it's all one mind. Very you nice. Know? So that's a beautiful very, thing. Yes, very, very nice. What I'd like to know is, We've talked about being together here, all right? And Cece made the statement, again, that what is the union between us as people? I'd like to know that what is the union between us? Is it that we're poets? Is there anything else that uh, joins us, that keeps us together or puts us together? Cece, what is the union between us as people? I, I, think, I think it's the... Um... The union between us, I think, is that we're all breathing the same air. All right. We're all drinking the same water, and we're all living in the same dimension, if if you will, rather than say land or planet. But we're all in the same frequency in in, in the context of uh, of Tesla. You know, if you want to understand <laughs> physics, there you, you go. Want, if you want to understand physics, you have to understand the dimension, frequency, and vibration. So we're in this frequency, but this dimension that we're in. And this purpose that we're gathered here today is to is to look up down upon that, not the word, maybe maybe the word down is the wrong word, but to look uh, as creatives at the responsibility that comes with, within a being, being in that, but for that concept and that limitation not to contain us to the point where we can't come up with solutions if there's a problem, even if that solution is possible. All right, very nice. Linda. I know you in a way, based on your being a guest on my show, and I know some of the issues that you advocate and champion. So what is the union between us as people, not just in this room right now, but as people, let's say in the world? Well, much of my writing is based on the concept of a collective mind. You know, it's like we're each cells in the energy field, if you know, etheric cells, but... Um, the, years ago, I learned about the French philosopher Thierry de Chardin, who he, he wrote The Phenomenon of Man, and he created the word newosphere to describe a layer of thought that hovers above nature and acts as a universal consciousness. It's what people think of as the one mind or the collective consciousness. Chardin actually felt that our thoughts go up to this energy field and they're reflected back, and that's when I came up with this concept, if it fits in with your question that if enough people could quiet their thinking just for a few minutes daily, it would quiet that newosphere. And if that gets quieted and that's what gets reflected back, incrementally, I believe it's a formula for peace and healing. I mean, everything that, that's needed right now, even, you know, people get um, inspiration when they meditate. I mean, we can talk about meditation in depth, but... Um, you know, when one quiets one's mind uh, and really puts a blanket on the inner thought system and, and listens within, I, I've lived my life by that. Even when, as a teenager, 
I mean, I did some crazy things and I would go within and ask. And then, you know, I was taught to meditate and chant on a mountaintop in Haiti in 78 and it changed my life. And so there's an inner, there's inner insight that's available to humanity if collectively, I really believe this with all my heart, all if right, we could goodness. collectively quiet ourselves. All right, collectively quiet ourselves. Paul, what are you thinking? What is the union between us as people? whether in this room or in the world. Yeah, and that's how I hear people talking in a very, and the, the basis of this question could be said to be in thinking and talking in a, a very holistic orientation. So when you're talking of this great term, uh, Linda mentioned, which I came across in the early 70s, noosphere, um, mm -hmm. this kind of collective consciousness and you know there's mm -hmm. a long history of this in 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 the history of thought let's just call it that mm -hmm. but um <clears throat> I, I when i hear this kind of specific topic um <clears throat> i'm given to thinking about the idea of uh a, there is a cultural basis for our unity as people on this planet and that it's cultural practice that um transcends mm -hmm. um all these other kind of artificial uh, borders we deal with the social the political the economic uh, the the ethnic and racial the religious it's a, a cultural practices that unite us all. Um, this goes back and uh, I've heard it said this was a quote from uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the first uh, democratically elected president of, uh, of Ghana, that he simply said there is a cultural basis for our unity as people on this earth. Mm. And when you look at that, you can start seeing how people um, who are creative have a very long history of applying culture in somewhat of an instrumental way to, to do that as a tool to bridge all of these divisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think specifically about uh, American culture going back um, historically, uh, it's always been American urban culture in particular in which creative activity is looked at as uh, getting back to Linda's first statement, as an open forum that has the authority to make comment upon the conditions we are in at the current moment and to explore those situations. And that mm -hmm. gets us back to here we are as this collection of poets and has, which has already been sort of teased out and stated here, our, our tend to be, at least in this generation or the, for the last few, people who take it upon themselves as part of their practice and as a basis for much of their practice uh, to stand up and speak out about those things which concern us, this open forum. So, so, you know, yeah. just to sum all this up, it's, you know, we're talking kind of holistically, the noosphere, the cultural basis for our unity as people on this planet. Those are the things I see that, you know, draw us together. They create these phenomenon in which are the contexts in which we play out our unification. And we, we do the work of unification, right. which is, you know, practicing our culture. Very nice, very nice. Marty, bring us home. Uh, the union between us as people. What is it? I want to know. I have an inquiring mind. <laughs> the union between us as people. So I truly feel that um, we are all soul searchers. I feel every human being wants to understand the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the hows about their life and um, the different paths that led them to where they are. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we live in a society where we observe and we like to ask questions. Um, so, you know, that's why I feel that, you know, us as poets, you know, we kind of help, we're like glue, you know? So, you know, we're able to, um, fix or put together pieces that don't make sense, you know? So I feel like, you know, that's, uh, you know, we're here to help, you know, with healing and building bridges to understanding. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I look at life as like, I've always looked at it as a, as like a big game and we're all pieces. Every single one of us, we're pieces to this game. And we don't even understand, you know, um, sometimes what's the best move to make. But, you know, it's like just this is humanity's chess game and we're all a part of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're all trying to make it to that nirvana, wh- whatever that may be, you know. I like that, too. You're an incredible group of people because you're sharing your thoughts. You're sharing, hopefully, from your heart in terms of what this question asks. And that's important because there are no rights or wrongs in a group like this. It can't be because we all have our own unique lived experience. And lived experiences are the stories that we share about ourselves and our world. They're unique to us. Unique to us. You know, Cece said that two of the foundational pieces of this group is primarily resolve and transcend. Let's talk about resolve a little bit more, just just to make sure we tease that out. What does it mean to have resolve with people? Somebody tell me. For me, resolve is one of the most beautiful words that I've ever come across in my life. All right. Um, right. Carries itself to the word uh, transcend in, in, in many ways. And it, it's basically what inspired uh, the launch of the of this uh, uh, this this very uh, event that we're, we're we're trying to birth here. And I want to thank you all for being here as part of this birthing experience. Mm-hmm. It starts from nothing. Uh, uh, we we are as as life forms on a planet collectively and individually isolated, and yet, as you've all mentioned, the one mind to play out this unification. Uh, we're here soul searching, we observe, and you even mentioned we don't even understand our role in this. I, I personally don't go with, with the word game, but I understand that, and so does Tom Campbell, the, the physicist, saying that uh, uh, w- whether or not we live, in, we live in an actual construct, a digital construct or not, uh, comparing uh, the, the age of the toaster to where we are now with technology, to who we are as a life form, to who we can be as a life form. It's a very interesting uh, field in physics right now. And as a poet, physics uh, uh, has also been a very big part of the word resolve for me because uh, science and religion, when they come together, uh, they're they're really not in in, in argument with each other. Uh, They can't be if there is going to be a resolve of who we are, what we are, why we are, where we are, and when we are. So these are the the unifying factors that we should not be afraid of and we should not divide ourselves uh, between opinions and points of views, between truth and honesty, which is also something that happened to birth this uh, in a conversation with Michael at the end of a, a, a one of his interviews that, that, that he did where I was the guest. And it ended with this strange statement of... Uh, uh, one of the greatest things I've ever learned in life is the difference between truth and honesty. And I think there is a difference there, but maybe that's for another time. So, but on the note of the word resolve, I think it is a way home. I think it is a way to, to bridge worlds and everything that everyone has said here. Um, it's, it's a beautiful word. It's an important word. It's, it's the end. It's the opposite of dividing us. All right. It is- All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please talk to me. All right, I'll I'll go. You know, I had written, I did look them up in my dictionary, um, and I'll give a few de- definitions, and one of them sparked a thought in my mind about something that has been very meaningful in my life. So to resolve, to deal with successfully, clear up, to find an answer to, to make clear or understandable, to find a mathematical solution of, um, to reach a firm decision about, so that was, you know, the um, it's like commitment when you resolve to do something. Mm-hmm. And it, there's a quote about commitment that just changed my life, if it's okay if I share it. Yes, please share it. Okay, so um, when I first came across it, it was attributed to the philosopher Goethe. And then um, a minister shared it in a church in Sarasota, and I went up to him afterwards, and I said, Don, that's Goethe's quote. And he said, oh, no, um, a Himalayan explorer named W.H. Murray wrote the paragraph, and he ended it with a couplet by Goethe. So it's along this, you know, it's parallel to resolve. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, 
There's one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one, which never otherwise would have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have guessed would have come his way. And the couplet by Goethe is, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. All right. So I, I, I think that's right along this, you know, yes. right with resolve. It's Well, I'd like you to share that last little statement again, the ending that you, that you just read. Say that one more time. You know I'm a listener. So I want to really, really take that in. The last, um, one, the last little line. Thank you. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you. It's, All right. It's All just, right. I mean, it's been, I've witnessed it, so I'm just thrilled <laughs> to share oh, it. Right. It's Very nice. Very pretty nice. amazing. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Anyone else resolve? Because I have a question. Then we're going to move on to the topics of the day, but I think it's important for us to, to talk about these things too. These are the foundational pieces. Anyone else resolve? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so um, resolve, um, for me, when I, when I hear that word, it's, it's almost like it's a burial. It's a, you're laying to rest conflict. That's what I wrote okay. down. Resolve equals laying to rest conf- conflict. All right. You no, know, it's the long exhale. It's when you take in that the stresses of life or, you know, whatever challenge is thrown at you, you take it in. But when you're able to to give a give yourself a real cleansing breath of, you know, you exhale it all out and you overcome it and you say, OK, you know, I know what I have to do next. That that's what I think resolve is, you know, oh, let's see. It's, okay. just, it's just a step in the process of healing. All right. All right. All right. Very nice. Very nice. You know, CC also said transcend the impossible. So it sounds like we, we resolve ourselves to transcend the impossible. How does that happen that you transcend the impossible? Is it possible? I yes. Wonder, somebody who, who said that? Yes, yeah, Cece. <laughs> okay. Cece. <laughs> I can't see anybody behind the screen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're good. You're good. All right, then. Uh, I I think transcend the impossible is where every next breath should begin. Uh, Reality has its way of forming itself around us, and we think we're stuck in that little uh, one-dimensional, maybe even two-dimensional reality that we now have to conform to this thing that happened to us and around us, when really if we have peace in our hearts, even if we're surrounded by, uh, by eons of fear, we don't have to be afraid. We could right. begin there. Mm-hmm. We could transcend the impossible at the beginning mm-hmm. of every next moment, mm-hmm. uh, laying to rest. It was beautiful that you said that, Marty, because, uh, you know, the long exhale. When the exhale, these death terms that are really beautiful, we should not be afraid of dying. So transcend is like we transcend every breath with a new breath. We shouldn't be afraid of these things either. And you also meant, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the ignorance kills countless ideas. And, and ignorance is, is something that once we become conscious, uh, which, which Paul mentioned earlier, uh, once we become conscious, the, the transcendence is, is, uh, is, is that it's not innocent anymore. But there is two things I think that ignorance and innocence come together about. And, and one is that uh, innocence is genuine all right but ignorance means you now are past innocence and you are now taking advantage oh, of yeah, it very, you are expropri- you are expropriating uh, a, a certain level of power where you're now using it for yourself and not simply giving back to what it is that you receive and you're 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 blocking you know the the the, the cycle of life right. uh, in doing so so transcendence uh uh, is where I think we should begin. And I think we're doing that here in these okay. conversations. No, I'd like to thank Mari for her statement because I needed a minute to ponder it more. 
<laughs> That's why I didn't come in on it earlier. I was like, wow. <laughs> She's profound. Oh, please. <laughs> Her thing, way of being. Okay, Paul, what about you, my friend? Transcend the impossible. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I'd just like to step back a second to, yes. the, to resolve uh, because I hear everybody you know, it's sort of an agreement about aspects of resolve that it's, uh, uh, in effect, it becomes a starting point. Um, it was talked about in terms of resolve is very similar to having a realization and uh, an acceptance uh, and uh, kind of identifying and coming to terms with uh, what your imperative or your task at hand is. And so that's tied up with, a, uh, you know, awareness, recognition, of, you know, sort of self-evaluation or evaluation of your, your circumstances. And um, that becomes then a sense of uh, commitment and conviction. You, you know, if you're resolved, you have you will uh, have an inner conviction about what your uh, uh, belief and commitment to what your activity is going to be uh, going forward. And um, uh, because I endeavor to be bilingual, I think of sometimes when I look at concepts and terms to think about th what the words are for those terms and ideas in a, in a second language and thinking about uh, the the word sobre llevar in Spanish and it's you know over to literally to overcome to overtake and that's where you know resolve leads us into equipping us to overcome and overtake those things that become um, our impediments or our goals. And and so, of course, I am now speaking quite literally about forms of transcending. And mm -hmm. CC has a really uh, kind of great sort of practical magic of vocabulary when he talks about, you know, each breath is the start of a new transcendence. All right. You know, you're going to be an excellent host when it's your turn, Paul, because I like the way you summarize things. I like the way you summarize things. So thank you very, very much. So we're resolving, we're transcending, but how do we do that, good people? How do we do that? I believe we do that by processing some of the concepts that are beneath those two words. And today, the concepts are honesty and humility. Now, what I'd like you to do, <laughs> I'd like someone, if you can, to define honesty. Remember, these concepts are beneath resolving and transcending. Honesty. Um, if we're going in the same little uh, circle here, uh, and, and if anyone ever uh, it feels like they didn't get a chance to say something or they want to say something more, I'm hoping uh, you could just go ahead and speak up. I'm sure Michael will take oh, yes, care yes. of you there. Yes. So honesty for me uh, became uh, magical uh, because I, I, I came to a, a point where – I realized that honesty is not the truth and that truth is not honesty. And um, I began to embrace the word honesty because I think it only lives in the moment, right. in the very, very moment, in the now. And that honesty is gone. And now there's a new honesty and you cannot contain it. You cannot own it. You cannot control it. You cannot possess it in every new moment to thy known self be true. Uh, it, it, it reinvents itself uh, uh, again and again. And it's, it's the challenge of being alive, of being cognitive, of being, of having a, a, a third eye or, 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 or a frontal lobe or a pineal gland. Uh, it, it, it gives us a chance to, to really both express ourselves at the limit and edge of what we think we know and who we are. And at the same time, be humble about it and and honest about ourselves and what we don't know what we what we're what we're still learning and what question we have to ask next mm -hmm. and so honesty means a lot to me uh it's if i have a religion it's probably honesty and all that's right. probably how it would define oh, it. very nice very nice all right yeah. who's next 
honesty. All right, just had to think of it. Now you have me thinking. Honesty is not truth, right? Is that what you said, CC? I did. And it, that's a very, very factual statement. I feel like honesty is almost like a Freudian slip of the mind. Talk to us. <laughs> you know, I had, I had to think about it. What's the best way to, to talk? You know, honesty is like, you know, um, you know, it's, it's in the moment. It's like, uh, you know, like your friend, let's say you are with a friend and she she's telling you or he's telling you about someone that they're with. You're like, oh, you know, oh, that seems like a nice person. At that moment, you know, you're just, you know, hey, you know, being honest, they sound nice. But then when you actually think about it and you learn more of the truth behind it, once you look at the whole picture, you know, then you realize like the truth is like maybe this person wasn't the best choice or, you know, you have some other ideas about that person. So it's just, a, you know, honesty is like spur of the moment, you know? Okay, okay, okay. all right, all right, Linda, what about you? Well, you know, I'm, I did look things up in the dictionaries. And I read what I, <laughs> Hello, they, they really align with what I, my feelings Linda, are. So. But you're also going to talk from your heart too, right? Well, I will, sure. Okay, but, right. you know, um, but So That's adhering important. to the fact, sincerity. Well, I mean, sincerity, there isn't, there's sort of an, you know, an inner voice matures, I think, as life goes on, mm. where one hears oneself and corrects oneself. And, and the honesty, you know, and sincerity that one can have with oneself is, um, I mean, it just can be really profound okay. to right. to acknowledge what one hears within oneself and, and to be honest enough within oneself to make decisions based on that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just straightforwardness is another way, another word that I think right. fits in there. Okay. To be straightforward you, with oneself. and You did have a dictionary is, definition. I want to hear that too. Pardon me? You did have a dictionary definition. Oh, the di well, the dictionary was yeah. um, adherence to facts. Adherence to um, facts. And then fairness and straightforwardness of conduct. Um, calling for honesty in politics, it says. Haha. <laughs> and then um, honesty implies a refusal to lie, steal, or deceive in any way. I mean, that's you know, that's really aligns with what I was saying before. It's just that there's kind of like an inner, um, I mean, I, I've studied a path that calls it the thought adjuster, you know, that you, you have this inner mind or however you hear, whatever you call the inner mind voice that you hear. I mean, it's described so many different ways, but it's a guiding light to me and it's, and it's honest All right. and sincere when it talks. So I, I listen to it most of the time, you All know, right. to the I, best I like, of my ability. <laughs> I'd like to add one word that vulnerable is is a beautiful word to add to this little. Uh, yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Paul, bring us home. Honesty. Well, I'd like to kind of go slightly different direction with this. And it's interesting to, you know, hear honesty in some ways being t described by talking about what it isn't and so forth. Um, you know, there's honesty, there's the honesty of being true, what, you know, in the sense of being true to yourself or true to your convictions. And then there's, you know, honesty that is not the truth. And I think those are two very different types of thinking. Um, but I'd like to kind of relate this to honesty in terms of a practice of a poet okay. and 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 this has to do with you know if we look at these two terms honesty and humility um it, these have to do in the practice of poetry with self-disclosure and that is something all poets have to come to task with if you are going to put your your most um, heartfelt, most strongly felt mm -hmm. ideas, thoughts, if you're going to relate very personal experiences, uh, or even if you're going to talk in a very general way about conditions in the world, you're going to be 
grappling with a situation where you have to do self-disclosure. You have to be honest enough to say what you really think and basically not give about what anybody else says or how they're going to take it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's yeah, the, the real important um, uh, uh uh, can, you know, substance of honesty, how it comes to play in the practice of poetry like through the through the act of self disclosure. All right, I think it's only important to add because of the word fact that was mentioned that actually Paul and Marty are here because we were at an online poetry event that was hosted by New York and Poets Cafe, and the the theme of the night was uh, science and fact. And it was from their poet poetry that they did at that event that when this concept came to mind, their two voices planted in my head and, then, and, they, and they were the first two people that I thought of asking. And I just thought that that just happened to tie together in a beautiful, miracle, miraculous way. Marty goes, oh, here's something I just wrote today. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> that 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 I haven't felt so happy about since I heard uh, uh, somebody blew up America. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that was honesty. So I just want to. I think for some reason all that just came together. So uh, well, part of me for for jumping in there on that. So no thank, you, no thank you, thank you, thank for you for driving the ship here. I try my best. You know they talk about that honesty is the quality of being truthful. But what I want to know, Paul mentioned self disclosure. We've talked about being truthful. I want to know, and I ask this on my program every week, and I've had over 350 guests. I want to know, in terms of honesty and truthfulness, what is the role of a poet in modern day society? What is our role? If we talk about being honest, and if we if we resolve to to make this situation where it's palatable to everybody, and we're transcending, what is what is our role in this world? I have I have two things that I've been saying for decades, and that is to speak the ineffable, to say what cannot be said, and to say what everyone is thinking and feeling, but uh, for some reason everyone is afraid to say. So uh, those are the two little uh, things that I I go. Right. I'll, right. I'll leave I'll leave that one at that. We'll see. What all I right. Have. All right. All right. Someone else, talk to me. We're talking about honesty. We're talking about making a resolve to, to transcend the impossible. What does that look like in poetry when we're self-disclosing? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd be like Paul and bring it all together. What does it look like? I think well, it can help someone to see life and, and whatever's being discussed in a different light because it, you know, poetically, artistically, when you... You know, it's a vibration comes from it almost, you know, I mean, a very subtle that people, I mean, no one may notice, but they may, they might hear a poem and they just feel differently and their thoughts change. It's, it really helps transcend the, you know, transcend, there's the word transcend where um, just the, you know, the linear thinking, it reaches people on a deeper level and a higher level at the same time. All right. And um, so that, gives a person the ability to look at life in a different way, perhaps, than they had before they heard what was shared by the poet. Okay. Um, okay. And that's, I think that's the gift that we give, because people can understand sometimes, they can see things in a different light when okay. they hear poetry. It's true. All right. Yeah, I'm right with that. I, I agree. She's just articulated that um, well, thanks. much better than I could. Um, but I, I'm right with that. It's, you know, Michael has just such a big global question. What is a poet's purpose or function in society? And there's so many ways to look at that and argue it out. And it, it will be fought over by yes. various sides. And that's part of what goes on in any art form anyway. But um I, 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 and this, I want to bring this back to other things that have been said here, some of the uh, terrain we've covered about, uh, you know, the meditative part, um, the resolve, the transcendence. Um, to me, 
um, you know, one of the things I'm supposed to be doing as a poet is getting people to bring themselves to my words in a way they have not quite been asked to do before. So that's really what Linda's talking about. Get people to look at something a new way or startle them right. out of their every day into a different level of sensitivity and awareness, a different frame of mind. Oh, and, to, and for me, you know, if I have a assembly of people in front of me and I'm making sounds with my mouth and what I want to do is, to me, poetry and you get people to argue about this and say I'm completely wrong. It is that moment for somebody to uh, sort of reflect upon their own inner state at that moment and to uh, recover parts of themselves that, um, you know, the many forces in this world which converge upon an individual that have the effect of making them think less of themselves and depriving them of a way uh, so that they are not being alive in a full and self actualized way. So this is something poetry brings for us. It's this this moment where you have a, a, a chance to recover your own sensitivities, your own sensibilities, and to engage in being in those. You know, people talk about being in your skin. Well, being in your own spirit. It's a, it's a moment to be in your own spirit. Very nice, very nice. Marty, any thoughts? I'm sitting here writing, you know, um... So I have to take it back a little bit when I, you know, po as poets and relating it to transcendence, I feel like poets and poetry or just poets in general, we remind people that um, sometimes, you know, in order to understand poetry or to write poetry, you have to transcend the physical, you have to transcend your skin and you have to write from the metaphysical part of you. Okay. So you for me, the only way, like, I feel like I look at the, I, the way I look at the world, it's like I'm looking through Salvador Dali's eyes. <laughs> Everything is surreal to me All when right. I write my poetry. <laughs> you know, and that's what poets do. Well we have touched. to, we, we remind people, like, there's so many layers to a human being. The first layer is your skin. But there's something so deep. There's something deeper in there that we all have. And, you know, that's why I, I, I get angry when I think about, like, racism, because this means nothing. It's, it's that deep. It's that light that we have within that people forget about. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, yeah. The, the marrow of Marty's mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question, because we're discussing honesty, and we'll move on in a second, my question is in the chat. Oh ah. <laughs> a, on a soul level, probably uh, one. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta pay for that. My father used to say, I want to you know. I want to know how. You, you met, my father used to say, say "You made your bed, now lie in it." <laughs> Honestly, just take a stab at it. There are no rights or wrongs. You made your bed, now lie in it. My father <laughs> used to say that. So maybe on a soul level, it's one. But then again. Well, this... if our role in the world as poets to, quote, be out there, mm. provide. Can you, can you tell a lie me. without telling it to yourself, Michael? I don't know. Someone's See, about that, to talk to me. I don't know. I, I mean, think, I think. I think I think the question you says how many lies uh for the people listening the question is as poets how many lies do you get to tell before you are a liar Well now, there's a not... there's a question of intentionality here you know Absolutely. are you you know are you telling a lie be purposefully because you are intending to you know maliciously deceive somebody or as a poet I don't feel I'm a liar. I'm a storyteller. Okay. And being a storyteller gives you free reign to say just about whatever you are, are um, compelled or 
you know, brought to say by whatever is inspiring you or leading your mood. Okay. So, so Paul, when you say that, it's like I love that intentionality. So if somebody walks up to you and says, where's CCR Chagra? I'm going to kill him. And you go, well, he went that way. That's not a lie. <laughs> there are times when you, your, your basic self-preservation of, of, of uh, uh, obvious violence or harm is just right in front of you when it's going to happen. Where uh, If you need to uh, divert that, like in Tai Chi, uh, give it back. I don't think that's a lie, even if it is one. So yeah, that's good. now it's a good, we're, it's a yeah, good point. Now, yeah, now we're playing kind of fast and free with Michael's question because we can take these these acts and turn them on their head all the time like this. You know, you're not you're not lying. It's like it's like um, is hate a positive or a negative uh, emotion, or isn't something an act done out of hate destructive or preservative you know if you think about um just in 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 natural terms uh it's it's the animal world's equivalent of hate that enables many animals to survive uh, harmful circumstances oh, yeah. the, ze the zebra stripes hate to be seen all right, <laughs> right. All right. others what are you what are you thinking how many lies can you tell before you're called a liar in your work, in your poetry? Let's keep it specific. Well, you know, there's a, that expression, poetic license. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> um, was what, you know, that surfaced in my thoughts. So sometimes something can be described <clears throat> and another person will say, boy, you know, I don't see that at all or I don't know how you can say that, but mm -hmm. it's, the interpretation within one's mind and how and that's what's expressed in the poem okay so you know i i mean i don't know if it would be considered lying it's i i think poetic license really um gives it liberty <laughs> okay 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 all right yeah one last one for Mari. what are your thoughts on that you see i'm pondering i'm pondering <laughs> i'm pondering because um, I'll have to, uh, per, uh, to be perfectly honest, I feel like, um, I don't know, I lie. Okay. Okay. Because sometimes in my poetry, it might come across that I have it all together and, you know, and I really don't, you okay. know? So, so sometimes our poems are, extensions of endings that not necessarily have happened yet mm -hmm. so they're almost like our daydreams or dreams on paper so you know depending on how the po you know so sometimes you know you know sometimes it's not really the true ex experience that we're tr that we live you know so that's okay. all i just you know mm -hmm. but um the poetic license is is a uh, you know a valid point also you know mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> I, I use it. I use it freely. I flash it a lot. I say, "Hey, you see this right here?" I can right. see that. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, to talk about honesty, when I started this process of calling myself a poet back in the early days, I lied all the time <laughs> because my poetry was always about uh, oh, uplifting flowers and trees. That there was nothing wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. Everything was beautiful and fantastic. Mm -hmm with all this stuff in the background. But no, I'm saying to everybody that there's nothing wrong with the world. Even I'm saying it to myself, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not true. And mm -hmm. once I learned to move beyond myself and say, Michael, mm -hmm. tell your story as it is, you don't need to lie anymore. Mm -hmm. My definition of lie. That's my definition of lie. I think self, self, self disclosure. You yes, were talking about affirmation. Right. Yeah. And this is such a great topic to bring up because, you know, we are in the era where people call it in the public sphere, you know, the post truth, the post reality era. And, and you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. these people who started this whole thing go back to the big Bush regime. Not, I'm sorry, little Bush, not 
his father, Big Bush, but Little Bush, whose regime said, we are the people who create the reality. It's what we say that is the reality. And this gets to a much bigger question about, again, the practice of poetry and what the power of words, the generative quality of the spoken word, the power of the word to create reality. Exactly. And, and so, you know, you can get into some real tail spinning, mind spinning discussions here when you talk about how, you know, when we're speaking poems, we are creating the reality. We are leading the minds and consciousnesses and spirits of the people who are our listeners. And these are the very things, the very sort of fundamental aspects of speaking the word that we see being fought mm -hmm. about so much today in in media and the public sphere about you know post truth or we're the people who create the truth. Right. Yeah, I just want to share just a little bit further. For me, initially, I was afraid to share the truth as I even as I saw it, because I thought, well, what will people think if I say what's really going on in my world? How yeah. will I be perceived as a consequence of that? And See, then you were, it doesn't you matter were, what anybody else thinks, you know. But it took it was a journey to get there. Yeah. So you were coming face to face with that question of self disclosure. Do I dare do it? You know? Yes. Yes, very much so. Margaret, yeah. you want to say something? You seem I don't know whether you do or not, but <laughs> Yeah, no, I, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up because I um, I understand uh, that concept of uh, what you're speaking of. I remember like when I first started writing poetry, um, again, after years of me just forgetting about it, my poems were like about nature and the beauty of nature and, and taking time to listen to the sound of the trees. And that is not, you know, the world is loud and the world is chaos. So why am I writing about trees when I should be writing about chaos and, and, and collisions? Because that's what life is, you know? So thank you for that. Thank you. Then I could say, why shouldn't you be writing about nature? Mm. Yeah, both aspects. Why shouldn't you be writing about really birds both. and trees and rocks? I mean, should a poet be defined? Okay, because of what's happening in the world today, is that our responsibility to write about it? Mm. Yes. I think we should not limit ourselves. Correct. Okay. 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 I think it's it's a. It, I think that boils down to a body of work because a poet has a life. There, we're just uh, bipedals. We're born. We live. We die. And when we're done, we leave a body of work, and hopefully, it doesn't end up in a dumpster. <laughs> just to be really honest about the wealth of our our, our journey here and how it is appreciated or not. Even well, the concept of money is is also a beautiful thing that kind of popped up in and out of here a little bit uh, of what, what it's worth. Or is that something I, I read just before it started? <laughs> right. Uh, Kathleen has a comment in the chat, and she said, I find it a weirdly modern notion that the ugly is more true than the beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's awful. <clears throat> wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, f I found in my journey, and I was a cab driver for 10 years, and and uh, and then I was in the movement arts for, for a, a decade in and out, as far as focuses go. Uh, both have uh, gone with me on the whole ride, uh, mostly since adulthood. But uh, I found that if, if honesty, I mean, ugliness and beauty, it's another beautiful uh, thing, that their soul lessons are the same. I don't know what that means for anyone listening to this, but... I think the sole lesson of being or thinking you are or this thing is beauty is an identical sole lesson when it comes to the resolve of what is beauty as, as the sole lesson when it comes to resolve of what is ugly. I think they merge in the middle. They're, they're opposite but the same. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I felt that this was timely to, to interject that. If it, I hope that makes sense. All right, Will. We the yin and the yang, CC. <laughs> it's it's a very like the, the, how ugly is really can be really beautiful and it beautiful is. can be really ugly. Be ugly, yeah. yes, that's true, absolutely. So the soul it's lesson, all, yeah. <laughs> but they each they each have to learn the lesson of I am ugly or I am beautiful or I am beautiful or am I ugly? It, it, it's almost there are there are parallels in a strange way or or they or they intersect. 
Well, think about think this one. Paul, well, Paul, I want to hear what Paul thinks about that because you got a good, you got a good. You know, I've being some. You know, I'm like a lot of you. I've done poetry and creative work for my whole life, and one of the things you come up against is, of course, people's reactions or interpretations or non-reactions to what you do. And I, especially when I started to get into doing work that was coming, trying to take face-to-face -face difficult subjects, whether I was doing self-disclosure about very, very sensitive things in my personal life, or whether I was writing about, um, again, the many forces that converge upon an individual that have the effect of making them think less of themselves. Whether I, whatever I was writing about, whether it was um, piled with beauty or piled with ugliness, my concern was, am I uh, creating what I'm after here? I don't want to get uh, stuck on, is this dark or light? It's okay. most important for me if I'm going to be doing something honest and reaching the goal of my resolve, does this thing I wrote down work? Whether it's beautiful, ugly, whether it um, invokes a trauma in somebody or laughter, does it work? Am I, is it really honest? Is it stand, does it, you know, people use this phrase, does it stand on its own? So I really try not to get caught up to in front of putting something down on the page. Am I going to create something really beautiful or really ugly? Am I going to create something full of love or full of hate? I'm responding to that which is inspiring me to create and write. And I have to be true to that and honest with myself about that. Wherever I go and wherever it ends up, whatever is on the page in the end, whether it pleases somebody, pisses themselves off, or causes them to faint out of trauma, I want to know I was honest and I got what I was after. I'm being true to that which is calling me to reveal it to other people. Very true. Nice. You know? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a perfect segue into humility. Look in your chat, please. Why is it important to be humble in your poetry? How does it improve community? Can it ever hurt the community? Hmm. Well, here we are, you know, again, this is my really important concept for me and underlies much of this, again, is self-disclosure. All right, then. You know, and there's nothing that really can quite characterize self-disclosure. Then you do have to be speaking from a sense of humility, of, of humbleness. Um, why? You know? Why? Why? Why, Paul? Why do you have to be, why do you need to be hard? I, I mean, I just want to know, again, not that I'm cutting you off, I just want to know. No. I want to know. Yeah. Um, and when I say humble, you know, in this, that's a starting point because, you know, you can load your, your create, creative output with all sorts of conceit and hubris and uh, um, uh, emotions and attitudes from the other end of the spectrum of humility. But in the, it, it, yeah, I'll put it in just a kind of uh, vulgar way. Anybody who gets up in front of anyone else or groups of other people to speak a poem, you're basically getting up there to drop your pants. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be <laughs> humble about it. And, you know, and, and that's, again, you know, humble, honest, um, and it's self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, whatever you're going to say, um, however uh, uh, impressive it may be in whatever way it's impressive, in the end, people got to have a sense that it comes from your honesty, your humbleness, your ability to be um, vulnerable. That's a thing that draws people in. And, you know, I'm not going to say 
you absolutely have to do that to create, some, you know, a poem, a painting, or whatever. But that, Michael, I think to answer your question, you have to be humble if you want people to get drawn into what you're doing. And that, you know, this gets into more technical things about what, what rhetorical attitude you're using in what you've created, because in a poem, you can be somebody oh, who, you, uh, you know, you can be somebody who's uh, basically tickling somebody, or you can be somebody who's shouting at somebody. You can be somebody who's seducing somebody, or you can be somebody who's commanding the listener. You know, there's all those approaches, but underneath it, there is that that self-disclosure. And to do that, you got to get up there and drop your pants, all right, for lack of a better thing. All right, Linda, what are you thinking? Would you like you pondering? Well, just, you know, I just feel a humble is sort of a quiet self where... One um, isn't like doesn't project that there's an Im impressed feeling about something, you know, that you just um, are more centered within oneself, I guess, and and not you know not think too great about when one's humble that just to feel like you're moving along with whatever's needed, but mm -hmm. not making too much of it, you know, you just keep going. Right, very nice, very nice. Marty, any thoughts from you? Yes, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yes, actually. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, why is it important to be humble in your poetry? Um, well, for that, you know, to answer that question, poetry cultivates your humanness. Mm. It reminds you that we are humans. We're not these, you know, super power beings. We're not at the top of the food, you know, the food chain. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just, you know, we're just as susceptible to being prey as a mouse, as a worm, as any other creature in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that just understanding that and, and writing or, and, you know, having poetry that expresses that, it, poetry is the ribbon around the finger. Oh, that, wow. that it's the reminder, our words are the reminder for people to remember that humanistic values, those humanistic values about us. All right. I like that. And I had an epiphany, then we're going to wrap it up. I had an epiphany that uh, people want to be, people don't want to be talked to. They want mm. to have a conversation with. You see what I'm saying? And to me, that's where the humility and the humbleness comes in. I'm with you. I'm not telling you what you ought to do. Mm. We can talk about it in a conversation. So I think in my poetry, that's what I attempt to do, is to, to, to be with the people and not <laughs> put my story on top of the people. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy. That's not always easy. But that's what I strive for. I'm learning so much from Paul here. He, he 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 brings us to another dimension outside of the one we're talking in. And, and I want to put together the word humble and conceit that we could be. I mean, it's just it's in a weird thing. But sometimes poets, I think, struggle with this or or run into it or are blinded by their own humility running into a form of conceit. And uh, and by that, I mean that humbleness kind of like like he said, drop your pants or be naked or vulnerable in front of you and just in real time with your life in the moment that that is a kind of a, 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 a you, you you want people to witness your own death so that you could be free inside yourself again and sometimes uh the muse is a, is a is a tricky element in this if i could expand on on those of you that are listening uh from from the context of of being a writer and the things that we struggle with uh, or 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 challenge ourselves with, or are brilliant with, um, that our egos can get involved in that. Uh, mm -hmm. that. That we could actually have an egotistical sense of humility, and because and when doing so, I think what I've witnessed in myself and others is that we get attached to a muse, and 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 uh, and uh, I always fall back on sometimes my own humility poem that I wrote a long time ago called, called "Beware." And the opening line is, beware the muse junkie. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so the humble, and, and that also makes me think when, when you talk about um, being selfless is another form. You think you're up there with your poem or your poetry or your art or your painting or your playwriting or whatever it is that you're doing in the different art forms. And, and you do this thing, but in order to be an artist and, and express in the different avenues that Paul mentioned, the different ways you could approach this piece of art that you're going to give to the world, that it can be interpreted as, as selfish. Because who are you to say something beautiful or ugly, you know? And it's weird. So you have to get past your own skin, like, like Marty said. And, mm. uh, and, and, and everyone here... Uh, you know, my humility and humbleness is the fact that you're even here. Oh, my God. It's like, what are you guys doing here? Where am I? Bitch me. No, as, about- as we bring this to a close, <laughs> share what's in the chat. Here we go. If we're resolving to transcend the impossible, we should be say we need to be honest in our work and humble in our understanding of whatever it is that you're dealing with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I thank you, and I turn the program back over to Cece. All right. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank right. you, yeah, thanks, Michael. Michael. Yeah. thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. All right. I, 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 don't, I don't need you to turn it back to me. Does anybody want to uh, just uh, – how about some closing words? Anybody? And we'll, and we'll go with that. And I also want to thank uh, 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 listening and future guests, T.A. Niles in the background and Kathleen. Uh, and who are welcome into this, and Zumkondo, who could have been here, but he was he was double double booked uh, for today. So there's some beautiful people coming on on board, and um, so I don't know uh, who wants to <laughs> two three Marty, Linda, Paul. You want to just wrap us and take us home with some closing thoughts, and and you have my gratitude and my love, and I hope mm-hmm. to see you again here, and and let's do this again, and then we'll step out of our own way and let others. And I hope each and every one of you decide at one point in time to actually choose to uh, take the realm and host this. And uh, we'll talk. Thank you. So uh, is that any order you want to go? Somebody, somebody start. And then uh, that's it. I love you all. Thank you. This is the way you handle a Sunday afternoon. You sit down with a group of people, right? And you unzip your brain and you, you just, Sit and let everything flow out into, you know, the the the, the main frame of society, and and we we spill our knowledge, and it's a beautiful thing to hear what's happening in the workings of the minds of our 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 poetry or our poets. It yeah. is a beautiful thing, and I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yes. All right. All right. All right, Linda. What well, you- I could actually yeah. echo that. I'm going to make a comment that I saw Ta's comment in the chat, and okay, um, it just you know it's nice that he's here. Um, I think that this is a wonderful forum for people to. I mean, it's exciting to be a part of it to hear the dialogue and and be stimulated by people's thoughts, and they're they're all topics that are um, in our minds and. You know, just it was a great discussion. I feel I, I feel lucky to have been here. All right, very blessed. Thanks, mm-hmm. both of you, okay. everyone. Paul, what about you, my friend? Well, uh, thanks to you, Michael and CC, for creating this right. vehicle, this space, and you know, uh, Linda and Marty and uh, Kathleen and TA for being here uh, and collectively creating this. Um, I look at these opportunities as I do, uh, for instance, going around the block from where I live here to the brick and mortar New Eurekan Poets Cafe. Mm-hmm. It is an, it is, and this is an action space where people come and talk about those things that concern them. Uh, and that to me, this has been entirely successful and then some in being that action space. And I think that the the topics here are just uh, very crucial. Um, you know, if we just start thinking ab- about what's going on in our uh, world and environment right now. So any one of these, each one of these opportunities we have to come together in the cultural basis for our unity as people here on earth is a reparative and healing act. 
And to me, that's one of the most uh, substantive and important uh, uh, aspects of these action spaces. Thank you. Well, I'd like to say I want to thank you as well for allowing me to to do this. I mean, <laughs> this is totally new. You know, it's just this put it together on the fly for the most part, just not knowing what to say, but to say the truth, you know, to be honest and be humble with it, you know, so that's important. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cece, for the opportunity. Paul, Mary, <laughs> I got your name wrong, Linda. <laughs> so thank just thank, thank all of you, because again, there are no rights or wrongs. No one knows everything. And the next person that does this, their way of being will be totally different than mine, because my story is not their story. Yeah. We don't approach the world the same way. We could have the same topic, you know, hump, same topic, and it could be a totally different presentation. I, I'm grateful. I'm I'm really grateful, especially for, uh, and you said something about this as a success, and even even, you know, I mean, shh, my my heart's on its knees. <laughs> so. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, I guess we're going to have to find a way to wrap this up. And the final words are, 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 are always uh, uh, important. So what I would like to say in, in, in reference to this being a premier uh, pilot uh, journey, and I, and I do believe that this, this we, we, could, we could put a bow on this baby and, and, uh, and present it to the world <laughs> in due time. But uh, I think each and every one of you can, uh, uh, in, in your due time, come back here as a part of the round table and also to take the realm of host i want you to think hard and and deeply about suggesting individuals that you think um would belong here and i hope that they i hope we set an example today of how we could have these perspectives and points of view and and ways of of, of answering these questions but never stepping on each other there was no superior here there was no mm -hmm. inferior here really there were lovely. no winners here there were no losers here and i hope we did at least that if nothing else to anyone else that chooses to step into this uh um what did you call it of uh, uh the space Beautiful word you used, action space. A action space. Action space. Action, action space, so, that's so, a good way. So, so thank you for that. Uh, maybe that will be the title, because <laughs> we're, we're working on the title. Mm -hmm. But um, I love you. Thank you. And um, stick around for after. We're going we're gonna to do a little something that to, 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 to see if we can sure this thing up and bring you more. But for those of you listening, um, nothing but love. Bye. Love. All right.